Welcome to A Kind Life. Today, I'm extremely grateful and honoured to have Leif Coxie. How are you going? Good, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Now, I would say I've always um, had a fond love of orangutans ever since I was a little girl. And I've always said to my mum that we were going to do a trip to Borneo and that hasn't happened with COVID, but I'm very keen to make that happen soon, which I'm sure we'll talk about in, in the length of this podcast. Mm-hmm. So tell us about yourself. For anyone who may not know you, give us a little bit of insight into yourself. Um. Oh, I've been just working with orangutans for about 30 years now in all, all various forms. Um, about 12 of those years, just constantly working hands-on with, with orangutans. And obviously over that time, I've developed an admiration and love for them, um, learned that they're self-aware persons. And of course, we also learned that they're critically endangered and being killed and slaughtered at, at virtually the agricultural pests. And so that's basically formed the, the core of my journey um, to save the orangutans as well as their entire functioning ecosystems that which they need to survive in, as well as taking all the other species such as elephants and tigers along for that um, conservation umbrella. Yeah. And how did you get to establish the orangutan project? You know, often in what you do is you... You want to solve a problem, which in this case, obviously, um, saving orangutans for both for welfare and conservation reasons, and all the other benefits that ha- it ha- the saving rainforest provides from indigenous communities to local economics to mitigating climate change, and, and so, and we saw that there was a gap there in in the sense uh, that we, we needed to be filled, and so we started. Um, the orangutan project and now we have um, seven affiliated charities across the world um, as well as you know um, I'm on a technical advisory group for um, you know six foundations and companies affecting the change on the ground and so it, it's obviously grown over the time as we've as we've had to um, keep rising to to meet the challenges that, that are facing orangutans today. Yeah. And how did you get these 30 years of experience? Where did it start? Mm-hmm. I was working with him at a zoo and, um, and yeah, and so, but back in, back in my day, there, there wasn't much on occupational health and safety or any of this stuff. So I just, here's some orangutans, that's a diet sheet. This is how you open the doors. And so I just started working with them it was really very little training or knowledge of orangutans. So I just went in and had my lunch with them and, you know, just, and, you know, spending time with them, uh, you know, being there with them when they have their babies, you know, nursing the babies, um, taking them, the mothers, and of course, eventually taking them back to the wild to be reduced to the wild. Because it was m- much later in my journey to, with orangutans, I discovered other people saw them as dangerous. And you go to, you know, zoos and there's, there's a big yellow line, one meter, you know, before the enclosure. Don't pass the yellow line, otherwise the orangutan is going to get you. Because you know, and I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> I've just been working in with them and having my lunch with them, and you know, and um, you know, for for, for years now. So. Um, but I guess in, in some sort of ways that was a huge advantage because I I didn't have any prejudices or preconceived ideas that was you know put down to me about what an orangutan is having really no formal training at that time although I had a degree in biology so obviously I, I knew about animals um, and the other aspect is going in with them and, and and having close relationships is a very different dynamic from um, looking after animals behind bars, <laughs> you know, where you have that, you know, that, you know, that, that um, authority and connection and distance and that sort of stuff. So you can really then become, really get to know them and become friends with them, you know, and and and, and go on a mutual uh, of journey of understanding, which which is very hard to do when you have barriers between you. Mm. And for us, you know, for any of us that aren't lucky like yourself that get to have experienced these beautiful creatures, you know, face to face, like tell us about some of their characteristics and things that, you know, we may not know about. Mm. I mean, w- one of the things, obviously, is they're the most intelligent being that shares our planet. And, you know, so all the science tells us that. 
Um, but it doesn't tell us a true story because animals are usually intelligent in only in ways that benefit the survival. Because developing a large calorie consuming brain for intelligence not required is very detrimental to your survival. So orangutans, they have an intelligence, for example, the temporal spatial maps, which are far beyond human capacity. Um, so for, from their point of view, we're dancers. They can't understand why we, we can't understand and learn things. The second thing is they have a rich culture and communication through, through body language. Um, and of course, one of, the, one of the things that people don't get with orangutans is they think about things many times and act once. So if you're looking after chimpanzees or gorillas, there's like, you're trying everything, you know. You know, and um, what a orangutan does, they're very, they want very, they're very intelligent and they're very interested in energy conservation, which is a key aptitude, um, attribute for, for surviving in the Asian rainforest. And so what you find, they just sit there and they go and they run basically a commute, computer simulation in their prefrontal cortex. Right? Okay, I'm going to do that, do that, do that. Not, that's not going to work. Let's run another simulation. And they keep running the simulations until, okay, this is how I'm going to do it. And, and one of the, you know, obviously the, the classic example, one of the orangutans I was looking after, um, you know, was taking every third brick out of the wall to form a ladder. But of course, they also have what intelligent persons have is called the theory of mind, which means they not only know that they're alive in a person, but they understand your person. With a different point of view, um, and so the, the orangutan understood basically. You know, one of my jobs was stop that orangutan from getting out of the enclosure. So every time it came, she would just put the bricks back, and then when I went away, take the bricks back and just keep working up the wall. So, and that's one of the wonderful things is that persons just like us was um, they project themselves from the past and into the future. Um, which unfortunately um, increases their suffering greatly, just as it does us, because persons not only suffer from the problems of the present, they suffer anxieties about the future and worries about the past. And this is why it, um, orangutans shouldn't be in captivity. They should be um, back in a while um, because um, persons never do well in captivity and um, can only um, um, survive and thrive in their own communities and culture. And I guess at what point in your zookeeping career did you kind of make that, I suppose, judgment that they shouldn't be kept in captivity? Because that would it's almost sort of going against what you, you know, what you've started mm. doing. Yeah, no, it, it, it's very interesting um, because the zoo world, like many worlds, they have their own, in a sense, subculture, you know. Um, and, you know, the great saying, the only difference between a cult and culture is the size of your group. <laughs> and so you could almost say that there's, you know, say many industries such as zoo, it's basically a little cult. And one of the things that the human mind really needs for our survival you know, back in the ancient days was we have to have belief in a leader and we have to have um, conformity to a common narrative to keep that group structure together. So we often believe things which are absolutely absurd because the rest of the group forces you to believe that. And so ideas like um, the zoo is, is um, a really good conservation place. You know, there's some great examples of zoos doing some wonderful targeted conservation work for, you know, for short periods for some animals. Um, but, if, but the idea of them keeping arcs of, of great apes and rank elephants and tigers that are going to survive in thinking crisis is, is, is a fallacy. In fact, my last job was a small population biologist, um, you know, basically doing the, the genetics and the mathematics behind that. And of course, it's all a house of cards. It's, it's, it's going to fall down. So, you know, for orangutans and tigers and elephants, they, they can only be saved in a while. You know, even though that's difficult, they can't be saved in captivity. And the other idea is that, you know, that, um, you know, animals may live you know, longer and healthier in zoos because they're free of the burden. When, of course, what my research did, because I, while I was there, I was, I was a zookeeper, but I was doing my honours, I was doing my master's studying the orangutan. 
And what we found out quite quickly is the orangutans live a lot shorter lives in zoos than they do in the wild. And because there's long-term stress, orangutans and us, we're very good at short-term stress, fight and flight. You know, that's what we're, we're geared for, but we're not really geared up for long-term stress because it, it reduces our immune system and basically destroys us from within. And orangutans in these artificial environments, not free to choose who, when, and how often they associate. So after these long-term chronic stress, which basically uh, limits their, their lifespan, as well as obviously many other things. But of course, you know, um, to, to then be completely honest <laughs> about what's happening, whatever, it, you know, that does ruffle a lot of feathers, not because the people who are ruffling your feathers and are trying to suppress that knowledge, they believe, especially the leaders like the, you know, the, um, the CEO of the zoo, believe they need to squash you in order to keep that group dynamic, that, you know, keep that group whole and that focus on their job. And someone like me coming along, wait a minute, we've been told this all this time. And it's actually not true. <laughs> this is, you know, um, and they get very angry and, and, and very defensive. And not because, like I said, they're bad people, it's because that's a natural human reaction. Mm -hmm. But for evolution, we need that. Um, and I just, just recommend, there's actually a quite a good um, documentary called Blackfish. It's, it's about orcas um, in captivity, which, which, and, it, and it interviews the orca trainers and, and through this process. You, and some of them, you know, realizing, oh, we've been feeding these lines and then we feed these lines to the public, but oh my God, it's not true. <laughs> and, and what journey that takes them on, it's, it's a very interesting. And in some ways I went in a parallel journey with my journey with orangutans. Um, as those um, um, orca trainers did in going, okay, what do you do when you, when you, when you basically start waking up <laughs> mm -hmm. from the cultural narrative and, and you need to kind of move on to, um, I guess, a more enlightened way of seeing the world. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's an interesting journey. I mean, mm -hmm. if, you, if you or anyone's interested, I've got several, I've got three books and the last two, um, my cousins, my friends, and finally humanity do, does document my journeys um, through a lot of this process, both mm. with the orangutans themselves, with the journey with the orangutans, but also um, the, the personal inner journey, I guess, to, to, to um, which is needed side by side in, in this, in this um, development. Yeah. I think it's really interesting because, you know, as children, I remember, you know, I grew up thinking I wanted to be a zookeeper and, you know, now being vegan and understanding, you know, the, you know, the quality of life for the animals there, you know, I'm completely the opposite, but, you know, we just, we are raised to think that, you know, like you said, that there's conservation value and that we're helping these species. But I know as well, you have mentioned in um, something else I've heard you speak before that, you know, the conservation dollar, you know, you get so much more out of it for trying to save um, orangutans in the wild than you do in captivity. Oh yeah, it's far more cost effective. So, so if zoos are conservation organisations, they're the most inefficient example of one that we can can imagine. It's obviously far better to um, do it in the wild. But yeah, the, the meat eating is a, is a great example. I mean, I was, I was brought up as a meat eater. Obviously, I don't do it now. Um, and you know, you and you 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 go to the party and say you're vegan. Honestly, there's there's there's, there's subliminal hostility because you are brought, you're challenging the, the narrative and of course by your very presence you're questioning the ethics and morality of, of other people which is confronting you know and you know and hurtful to, mm -hmm. to some extent because you, you're you're questioning that and it's not because of horrible people i've been there where you know we've had to euthanize a giraffe mm -hmm. you know and the keepers crying you know for this giraffe while eating ham sandwich yeah? mm -hmm. and and seeing no and no irony that they're happy to have some animals you know, killed and slaughtered for the pleasure of the of the taste, <laughs> while you know being genuinely good people and caring. And so, um, mm -hmm. it, yeah. But then, of course, over time, you know, this is why we have to be gentle with people, never harsh. And because criticizing other people is, is good for our ego because we feel superior. I'm criticizing you because I'm no, I am something you are not, and therefore I feel superior. 
but it doesn't affect meaningful change because the person basically hardens in the position, you know, um, and you, you, you just make things worse. And this is why we have to present the facts without, um, yeah, without uh, accusation, doesn't say, and understand that everyone else is on that journey and give them room, does it make sense? Mm. That room to, to um, go, oh, okay, <laughs> I can see now things are different and move forward. Yeah. And at what part in your journey did you become vegan? Oh, I can't remember now. It's, it's so long. First of all, I became vegetarian and then vegan. So it was this this, this kind of transition. Um, it, it was oh, many, many years. I don't know. I'm guessing 20 years ago, um, while, while, while still working with the orangutans hands on in the zoo. Mm -hmm. And what, what turned you vegetarian and then vegan? Well, it was understanding, it's it's almost, again, it, it's like waking up, <laughs> you know, um, and some people never wake up, they, you know, they're, they're, they're good people, and like, um, you know, they, you know, they love their dogs and their pets and the kind in the community, but still the slaughtering other living beings, you know, um, and it's not that, for example, you've got dogs, I've got dogs, you know, they 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 have beautiful little minds. They're conscious beings. Mm. My dogs have little doggy mares. I have mm. to wake them up. It's okay, you know, you're not being chased, and you know, we we know that, <laughs> you know, we, you know. Um, but somehow we can't connect that to, let's say, a pig or a sheep is is mm. is really just the same, no different. And you maybe some people argue pigs are more intelligent than dogs, mm. you know. And so um, we, we do have the massive ability for what we call cognitive dissonance mm. yeah and it's really there's a couple of reasons for it is one it's, it's enabled us to survive you know and our brains are set up it's ironically our brains are set up to um filter out information you can imagine let's say if you're walking through the rainforest savannah and if you're noticing every little thing your your brain will be overloaded you can't do it. so your brain goes this is relevant, this is not relevant. Yeah. That's how our brains are set up and you can survive. Yeah. This is why motorbike drivers always get people pulled out in front of motorbike guys because they're saying what's relevant is people, cars, lights, whatever. And because motorbikes are relatively rare, a lot of drivers do not, their brains are not picking up that motorbike riders are, are significant. So they can, they don't, literally don't see them even though they're, they're, you know, the light from the bike is hitting their eyes. Um, and similarly, in, in thinking, we, we can literally have these blind spots, you know, when you, but when seen from a, a, more, an, um, a more developed perspective, you, you go, well, how can I see, how could it be so silly? It's, it's so obvious. And it is obvious intellectually, but, it, but our human brain does have this immense capacity for cognitive distance, which, yeah. which, um, which, yeah, which unfortunately it's it led to so much suffering in this world. And, and, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you're involved in the first ever release of a captive or a zoo bred um, or born orangutan. Like, what, mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Um, yeah, so, you know, again, on the journey is to go, it was, you know, the interesting part of the journey is go, I'm looking after these orangutans. The, the conclusion from my research, my master's research and, and my personal understanding, is they don't belong in captivity. But that's my job to look after mm -hmm. them in captivity. So what can I do? You know, how, how you know, what's, what's the appropriate action? Um, and so when you've got a critically endangered species such as an orangutan, it's not only a welfare issue, it's a conservation issue because every individual is a genetic identity which is going to be critically important for the survival of the species. And so in the meantime, while I was there, I started the orangutan project. I was um, going to rescue orangutans in the wild, taking them to rescue centres. We had started funding uh, and supporting um, a release site where we can re-establish a population of orangutans went extinct in the 1830s. So I had all that kind of connections already on because that what simply what I was doing on my holidays. And so um, I then just had the opportunity of connecting those two things. Okay, you know, um, there was a lot of resistance from the zoo ministry of they didn't want, you know, a lot of complaints. How dare you take 
valuable to splay animal back to the wild, you know. And so there's a, there's a lot of resistance um, at the time. And of course, had to kind of, um, so that was the hardest bit, I guess, <laughs> the politics of many. Getting the orangutan back was a relatively, you know, complex but relatively simple compared to the human politics. And of course, um, one of the things that um, ex-pets don't have is a really good mental health because their mother has been killed in front of them, they've been treated badly, you know, had bad malnutrition, et cetera. So by the time they get to the rehabilitation center, they're pretty much poor little things of damaged goods. So it takes a lot of skill and a lot of time for the dedicated technicians to get from that stage to surviving a while. But the advantage I had is the orangutans that were born and raised by the mother um, and also the born and raised by the mother with me in the enclosure standing there. And so they knew me from birth. They're playing with me from, you know, 48 hours of, of birth, you know, and the mother knew me and trusted me. Uh, and so when it became a natural lady dispersion, um, we, we basically moved the orangutans to live in this large fig tree instead of feeding them in the tree. So they're living in the tree already. And then we were putting all the food in the tree. And then we would we'd always walk in speaking Indonesian <laughs> and train them to come down and open their mouth for inspection and, and inspect the body for, um, you know, body mass. And so we were doing all that training there. And then we moved them to um, the, the jungle and then we put them in a cage in the jungle and for two weeks just living in the cage. And But what we did every day, we went around and collected all the fruit and all the food. And so the orangutan was already eating all the food it could find in the forest while still in the cage, as well as climatizing and seeing all the monkeys and you know, getting... So when it got out, it kind of pretty much um, knew everything. One of the interesting things is, um, you know, it did make some night nests in the um, commanded in the fig tree, but we couldn't have too much because it should destroy the whole fig tree. Um, and in, in, the, in the, um, the cage, she made some, but it's not really like proper night nest. But one of the interesting things is, and this is the amazing thing about orangutans, the first night out, she made a night nest. She twisted the bone, made a nice pad pad and went in to go to sleep for a couple of reasons. You know, um, one is that they're just extremely intelligent. <laughs> you know, they figure things out, you know, they, you know, um, and that's one of the, one of the amazing surprises when we've done this um, orangutan introduction, it's one is you teach them um, this the cultural learning, social learning from other orangutans, all this sort of stuff involved. But one of the surprises along the way is they sometimes just figure things out. You know, no, they didn't see another orangutan do it. They, they didn't see you do it. You know, they just figured it out. Um, and that's just one of the amazing things about these beautiful beings. Yeah. And how, like, I'm not sure how long ago that was. And do you have any understanding of if that orang orangutan is still, like, did you track, like, did you have any form of sort of tracking or keeping an eye on them? Yeah, we, we, we tracked them out for three years. And um, what we normally say is um, if an orangutan can go through two non-fruiting seasons, because it, you know, um, um, then pretty much you can be sure that, you know, they can survive. And so um, Tamara was tracked through th three non-fruiting seasons. Um, but yeah, and so, and, 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 still, and still doing well. Um, since then, no, we, we, we haven't seen her. Um, so, um, you know, we always hope, you know, that, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, you know, 200,000 um, hectare <laughs> ecosystem, uh, you know, and, you know, um, yes, and, you know, and most, Scientists, they don't count orangutans when they say, oh, this, they count nests and then extrapolate how many orangutans it could be. So um, it certainly would be wonderful one day to um, come across her back into the forest again. Mm, yeah. And so tell us about your, the um, orangutan project has this holistic approach. You know, you're involved in rescue rehabilitation, um, you know, even working with local community groups. So I guess tell us about that approach and how it's successful. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the first, yeah, exactly. We, you have to have a holistic approach and it has to be a complex approach. Well, that's really lousy for fundraising because everyone wants a simple, clear solution. But my little saying is, um, you know, for every complex problem in the world, there's a simple solution which is absolutely wrong. And that seems to be consistently proven, um, you know, all the time. 
And so first thing was we did, we found a couple of species were falling outside the umbrella of orangutan conservation, and that was elephants and tigers. Um, so we started two separate projects to bring those under uh, our goal. And then you know, in order for this to save viable populations of orangutans, we need to be about 2,000 because of their social system. You know, so genetically, you can do the genetic, say, oh, you only need 500 orangutans, but hey, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Most males don't pass their genes to the next generation. If you understand their biology and social system, as well as genetics, it's 2,000, which means basically a 200,000 hectare ecosystem of the right type, shape, and size of rainforest. And of course, they want to preserve all the highlands because it's, it's not good for agriculture and it's good for water catchment. But orangutans and the elephants and tigers are all lowland species. They cannot survive indefinitely without the lowland areas. And, and especially orangutans, they need the river rainforest because figs which um, exist in the river rainforest are the all year round fruiting trees, which is very important in the non-fruiting season. So understanding the ecology and biology, we have to piece that all together. But of course, the other thing to know is the rainforest was never empty. It's full of indigenous communities. Of course, no one recognized their rights. So just as they were bulldozing the habitat of elephants, tigers, and orangutans, they're bulldozing habitat of the, the indigenous communities because you know they didn't matter. Um, and so basically you have indigenous communities trying to survive in the last remaining rainforest. And the agricultural systems and hunting and gathering, which was sustainable over centuries, is no longer sustainable because they require a certain amount of area for those systems to survive. And so this is, I was, my impression I say is orangutans may be the center of my love, but not the boundary. This is not how you work. You don't work, I'm gonna do this and don't worry about those people or animals, or don't worry about the planet or, you know, it's a win-win situation to do it right. Yeah, and that's most effective. So what we're doing is, um, let's say where we release tomorrow, we're feeding the, the, the school children and educating them. And you know, talk about um, you know, a good thing to do. Before we started doing that, the community didn't name their children until they're four years old because they're probably going to die if not worth it. Now they name them straight away. I mean, talk about <laughs> you know, helping somebody. And we do women's empowerment. Uh, and we're developing agricultural systems under the rainforest canopy to allow communities to prosper, not just subsist and fiber, but be empowered and prosper for the future. So our goal is to leave these ecosystems that we're working with the orangutans, tigers and elephants, and we've got eight of them that we, we want to save, not only leave them environmentally sustainable, but economically sustainable mm. um, for future generations. Yeah, and as you know, my latest <laughs> the, the word on my the, my latest talks I'm I'm doing around the world is a future we can believe in. This is something which which is which is which is inherently good for every living being. Yeah, because that's something you know we can't look at it in isolation. You know, as vegans or animal lovers, we might think that we need to you know put all our effort into the conservation of these species. But like you said, it's a full ecosystem, and it does you know we need to consider the impacts that you know having agriculture and, and having a livelihood for these indigenous communities. Otherwise, you know they do it becomes threatening for these species in their community. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, the, the, I. I put it that the fundamental error is that some lives are worth more than others. Mm. Once you make the error, it's just a matter of where you do it. Mm. <laughs> is it animals? Is it indigenous communities don't care? If people in other countries, you're a nationalist, you know, mm. if my country against your country, my religion against your religion, doesn't, you know, that, you know, is, once you once you create that initial error, er, error you know it's just a matter of where you lay the line and so for a group of beings you may be an angel but for many group of beings you're the devil incarnate mm. um, and what we're finding out through climate change um, wars immigration refugees the world you're not possible to isolate yourself from your your behavior you know, you know, maybe last century and a century before, you could exploit colonies and, you know, and people and animals and it didn't seem to ever bite you back. 
Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in a, in, a, in a Western democracy, you could exploit all other people and, and, and animals, and it didn't seem to have any effect on, on your outcome. But what we're discovering is it, it may have taken some time, but feedback loop is coming. So the, the moral elevation of people is not only a, a, um, a need for their, for their own happiness yeah. and, and um, integrity, it actually becomes a, a strategic need for the planet. Yeah. Uh, and so this is why I would say we can't reform the world unless we reform ourselves. Um, otherwise, we, we're going to get some fairly perverse outcomes, even if we're doing something as seemingly as noble as conservation. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, there are so many campaigns within the orangutan project, but I know one of the latest that you've released is um, the Freedom Within, where you're hoping to release four orangutans. Can you tell us about that? Mm -hmm. we're, we're working in the Busan ecosystem as another example. Um, when I talked about Tamar, we talked about Kida Samarchan orangutan, and, we, we, and that was the ecosystem there. This is this, an ecosystem in Kalimantan for the Pongo Pygmalis Moria subspecies of Bornean orangutan. And so what we're trying to do is, is piece together a large ecosystem there, the right type, shape and size of a rainforest. And part of that, the um, in the Ministry of Forestry, it granted that 20,000 hectares of the critical lowland to rehabilitate and release orangutans to try to boost this population and, and protect it. And but there's many other of the subspecies where they're basically they're, their forest is gone. It's been knocked for, for coal or palm oil, and they're basically an agricultural pest. And if they remain there, they will die. If not today, it's going to be tomorrow. You know, because one is there's not enough food. Their population are too small, fragmented, and basically, as a large, strong ape, they simply become a dangerous agricultural pest. So eventually, you know, uh, and you know, they also have some monetary value on the you know illegal pet trade and that, etc. So they're basically going to die. Um, so what we want to do is, yeah. So those orangutans are orangutans which have been rescued by our, our rescue teams. Um, the Bornean Orangutan Rescue Alliance, which is a joint organ, um, organization with the Orangutan Project and the Center of Orangutan Project which, uh, Protection, which is an Indonesian based organization of young, wonderful um, activist Indonesians, you, you know, who, who are out there um, helping orangutans and many other things. And so these, these rescue units are rescuing these orangutans before they get killed and then being rehabilitated, make sure they're disease free and um, going out to doing two things. The fact that why we got land was because of orangutan released. So there's 27 hectares more, which is safe because of orangutan release. So they're not only safe, they're saving themselves, they're saving the forest and helping contribute to the survival of species. And um, as well, we, we hope to work with the Longleaf diet community nearby. Um, which, is, which is a wonderful community. Uh, I lo love being with them. You know, it's um, fascinating and culturally intact um, society there. And, and we hope to develop, again, agricultural systems with them um, so they can prosper um, and while living in this um, is, um, economically and environmentally um, sustainable ecosystem and how do you like I guess it may sound like a silly question but I'm going to ask it is how do you you know physically I suppose protect orangutans within you know when you're talking about having this area to release the four do you have like is there people on patrols or is it just known within the area that there is it's a protected area like how does that work yeah no no very, very good question um you, you you never well first thing is um, there's a whole bunch of things you got to do before release, you know, making sure it's a suitable area, et cetera. You, are you going to, is there a wild population, is there a viable wild population, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all these things you, you know, there's a whole list of criteria before you even think about reintroduction. And, and one of those, pertinent to your question, is is there a threat and has that threat been removed? I mean, this, for example, this ecosystem 
contains about 600 orangutans, but can hold 2,000. Well, what happened to the others? You know, you know, had the threat we we taken those orangutans out of the gene pool? Had that been done? And then, of course, when you reintroduce, are, how are you going to ongoing? Are you going to um, do protected? So this is why you need um, security guards and rangers. And obviously, for, for the first um, the first period, the orangutans are followed constantly. Yeah, you know, because to make sure that they're okay and support them through that critical reintroduction period. But it does mean ongoing security. Mm. Um, now, you can win over the local community through win-win situations. You can go, like, we're going to do this for you, we're going to help you this and this, but we just please don't kill the orangutans, you know. Mm. Um, you know, that's kind of part of the deal, you know, because we need it for sustainability, etc. And that's, that's relatively easy. But what happens is a lot of these community, being, they have no way of um, themselves. Just because the community is supported, it doesn't mean, let's say, the orangutan is not going to be killed because it, it's rich, powerful, you know, corrupt people from the outside who might want to come in and exploit, the, not, not in the orangutans and trees and that sort of stuff. So without good security, um, you can't, protect the orangutans or even the indigenous rights because you know that they need support um because you remember as you know um their their land is gone mm. you know you know from their point of view it's like well you know you know palm oil plant knocked the frost and put it down often they use you know um dodgy means you know to mm. to declare they got indigenous consent but it is mainly smoke and mirrors and inevitably they, they do not benefit. In fact, in many cases, the standard living goes down um, because yeah, you know, these um, unsustainable monocultures are, well, one, they're all, like all monocultures are unsustainable, but secondly, they are just a simple exploitation model. They can't work any way, they extract it money from long term to the short term from the many to the few where the a diverse agriculture system and rainforest canopy that we're developing enriches a community you know yeah. so so they actually are going to become rich and prosperous and many are going to become rich and prosperous and traditional land is going to be rich and prosperous but if you're a big multinational and just want to rate the environment for short-term gain that's not going to work for you and, and so you promote these strange terms like sustainable palm oil you know i mean how can a monoculture ever be sustainable i i don't know but um it, it's certainly not good economically as well as environmentally it's yeah it's only only it makes economic sense is because they're part of the true cost of production of the powerless if they had to pay the true cost of the environmental services and damages they cause it wouldn't be economically viable and so therefore even if you're a, a economist you know any integrity you sh we should be looking at other systems um, in order to support people and communities yeah i think i read something in an article where you'd said which i suppose some people could almost think is slightly controversial is you know that um, you think it would be better for people instead of people focusing on, you know, sustainable palm oil when they're buying products in Australia, for example, that we'd actually be better to invest our money in organisations like yours that are doing on the ground conservation of species and trying to improve the whole ecosystem rather than, you know, worrying about that, you know, minute detail over here in Australia. Yeah, it's not not not, not that's minute. Um, uh, you know, that's not the that's not the essential argument. Um, that's, that's, that's what the, you know, the Australian government says, oh, we're just a small part of climate change, therefore, why bother, you know? And of course, if you add up all the countries mm -hmm. which were a small part of climate change, had the same thing, we, we can't save the planet, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's one of those kind of um, mute points, I guess, is that they use, it sounds logical. But that's why um, we have to have the heart to care, but we have to have the understanding intellect to understand the problem. And, and what, why I say don't bother about sustainable palm oil or banning palm oil, that sort of stuff, it doesn't address the driver. They cut down the frost for the value of the trees, which is pretty good business by itself. 
and they'll plant whatever unsustainable monoculture you get in the best income possible. And there's many alternatives other than palm oil. So if palm oil was the only alternative and it couldn't cut trees down unless to replace it with palm oil, yeah, sure, it would work. But that's not the reality of the situation. So not understanding the situation, not understanding the true driver of deforestation, we waste all our time, you know, but, you know, on palm oil or sustainable palm oil, whatever that is. All that allows us to do is to you know, um, what's called virtual, virtue signal. <laughs> oh, we're doing fine and we feel good about ourselves while they're destroying the environment, which is simply what's been happening. And I have the same argument against, um, you know, us changing light bulbs and having solar panels and riding electric bikes. All those things I do. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. But you think that's going to save the planet? No, nah, it's not. We have to collectivize and act intelligently in order to save the planet and, um and yeah, and and do those things, but unless we collectivize and, and understand and make meaningful action, we're simply just virtual virtue signaling, you know. And all I do is offer the orangutan project as one option where people can collectivize to make a meaningful change. Yeah. And I guess for people like here, yeah, us in Australia, like what can we do to support? I'm guessing it's extremely expensive to, you know, run these programs and even raise, you know, orangutans when you're talking about food and staff and round the clock patrols and things. So what can we do to help? Mm -hmm. Well, what I always say to people is, well, first of all, to say there's a couple of things. From living the most important decade in human history, which would determine the future of our planet. And saving the rainforest is one of the most economical things we can do to mitigate climate change. And the second thing is, in that decade, there's only a few people who can make meaningful change. You look at most of the population in the world, that poor and desperate or living in, in an authoritarian regime. Although, you know, our democracy is somewhat corrupted by the fossil fuel industry, we at least have a chance to effect meaningful change through our democratic and legal systems. So it's only a small of us are really going to be able to, to make the difference. And in this case, I'm saying Australians are one of those privileged few. And so, and we have to acknowledge that some of our standard of living is created from exploitation of others. You know, and, and therefore, um, if we're doing quite well, we have a moral obligation to give back to mitigate the, the effects of us eating into the future capacity of this planet. You know, um, and then I next step is to say, well, people say, well. What, what, what can I do? Well, there's two sorts of people in general, those who are um, time rich and money poor. So, we, you know, which is unusual, again, because we live in an affluent society. You can not have much money, but then you're not starving to death. You don't have to, you know, till the fields to try to survive. You've got some time. Volunteer, you know, donate your time to a, an organisation to make meaningful change. A lot of people on the opposite, you know, they're time poor but money rich because they've got well-paid jobs and that sort of stuff. And I said, well, you, you can give someone that. You can really make them, you know, you can make a huge difference because, you know, wages and cost of living is so huge here in Australia. But you translate that money into rupees, you know, supporting these brave young Indonesians, it goes a hell of a long way. You can make, you know, <clears throat> you know, amazing changes, with, with, you know, and um, ultimately that love and giving and caring um, actually makes our lives worthwhile and, and meaningful and happy. Yeah. And I guess just like as an example, you know, when you talk about the difference in, you know, the difference it can make our, our dollar compared to what it can do, the change it can make over there. Like I know, I think on your website, you know, you've got examples of um, different amounts of money and what, you know, what they mm -hmm. can support. Like, do you want to just, I suppose, give an example of that so people can understand? Yeah. I mean, the program, the holistic approach, and we've we, we discussed many of those things, but of course, People often go, actually, look, I'm really interested in helping baby orangutans, or I'm really interested in helping indigenous communities, elephants, tigers, or no, I'm really into saving rainforest, you know. And so that that's fine, you know. Say, so, well, this, this is how much you can do with with your dollar. And, and it's hugely significant. Um, and in the bigger picture, you know, I will say you are what you measure. So if a charity says, look, oh, we got, you know, 500,000 viewers, we make $20 million a year. Well, 
and we got some we got a, some antidotal evidence that there are some happy children somewhere yeah okay no but you got to measure it doesn't make sense you know in our cases how many orangutans have you rescued how many orangutans have you re released you know how many how many hectares of the forest are you protecting? How many have you gained? You know, all those things that you know are measuring. So people can go, okay, they've got this much money and they've measured this effect, meaningful change. And some of that meaningful change is important to me. You know, and it's the trees, the orangutan, the elephant, the tigers. And so um, if, you know, so then it becomes relatively easy, you know, for a relatively small amount of money. You know, it get translated into you know a developing country like Indonesia as a, a huge, huge amount of effective outcome um, at the um, coal face. Yeah, yeah, and you can definitely see that. It's great on your website. You know, you are very specific, um, sort of like an annual report on numbers, like you said, exact numbers of these kind of things, almost indicators. It, it, exactly, and that's what. I want it in a sense, it used to be called the annual report and it still is, it's a financials and that sort of stuff, which is important for integrity to publish that every year and have it on your website. But we just used to do that. And then I go, well, I know that doesn't interest me. That's just a means to an end. You know, what interests me is the impact on the ground. And so there's, of course, the next obvious realization is well, actually, that may be actually <laughs> what our donors want to know. So that's you know that needs to go in the annual report, and therefore it became an impact statement. You know, to go yeah, um, to, yeah, about the meaningful change that our donors are, uh, are, are making real and making it happen. Yeah. And something as well that I really love is that you also um, have through orangutan odysseys. There's eco tours available. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let us know about how that works because a lot of people want to be able to, you know, travel more sustainably and not have a negative impact on species or the environment. Yeah, well, unfortunately, most ecotourism is really dodgy mm. and often is really detrimental to animals and the environment. And, and there's cases of that with orangutans as well. So it's very important to choose an ethical um, tour company like Orangutan Odysseys where you know the environment, the animals are protected. Um, and the, the second aspect is we, we've got a partnership with them for, for many years now. And about six times a year, various tours from, you know, um, you know hardcore <laughs> living in a tent in the jungle to, you know, um, to sitting on, on boats, eating fried bananas, watching the wildlife, you know. So <laughs> depending on your level of tolerance for adventure. So we have a range of them and, and we take people on these journeys to, and they get to not only experience the rainforest and the rain tanks, but see the work that their funds are going to contribute to. And of course, we use this, the, the tours to raise money themselves. And then, yeah, um, as well as seeing the orangutans and the, the forest and being engulfed, you, you meet wonderful people. And every night I, I give lectures and, and, and you know, on different subjects and, and, and take people on that journey. And of course, um, yeah. And the wonderful thing is um, I've got so many friends now <laughs> because I make so many friends on the Echo Tour. So pretty much every city I, I go to, um, I, I've yeah, always got a, a spare bedroom for myself, which then makes it very cheap <laughs> exactly. for, yeah. for me to do the tours because um, I, I, I've met and so many wonderful people. Yeah. And you, do you um, provide, like, do you go on all the tours or is it certain ones each year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I do about six a year and a couple of things, you know, they were, all the meals provided are, are, are vegan. Um, um, so all that kind of stuff. So for some people, that's the introduction, you know, and they come out, oh, well, actually, I didn't mind it at all. It's actually quite delicious. Um, however, uh, Orangutan Odyssey, you know, with, with Gary, um, him and his guys can take anybody anywhere, anytime. So, so people who don't want or can't go on the tours, um, Gary can actually tell and made um, in any any trip for any level of interest um, um, for them. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I guess that's a question I do have, you know, is where do you, I suppose, integrate that message of veganism in the in conservation? Mm -hmm. um, I certainly, my, it's a, my cousin, my friend, is, is, is quite, a, uh, I, I do touch on a, a, a bit. 
Um, but, you know, from the bigger picture, look, we know why the, you know, a huge amount of climate change is caused from the animal industry, you know, and environmental destruction. I mean, ironically, you know, a lot of um, um, coastal um, seas have been destroyed by the animal industry, you know, the effluent going into it, that sort of stuff. And all the pandemics come from, because we evolved only to really coexist with one animal, the dog. We've evolved, co-evolved together. And so we get all the other diseases from, you know, pigs, um, you know, cows and chickens, that sort of stuff, because we're not meant to exploit with them living closely. So that's where pandemics come from, that exploitation of wildlife. Of course, I mean, I'm not, I don't know much better. I think there's some health issues from health benefits from being a vegan, but certainly there's no health downside. I've been, you know, running around the planet quite happily as a vegan for some time and I haven't fallen over yet. Um, but so there's all those kind of intellectual reasons that make sense, which just makes veganism just a no brainer, you know, um, but the other aspect to it is, is, is when what happens is this is my, my personal belief. If you're unhappy, you want to make the world unhappy and you become defensive and that sort of, but it, if you find happiness and joy within yourself, you have to spread that out. It's a natural flow of one's joy and happiness. In other words, love. And it gets to once you get to that state, it's not it's not that you have to give up something or stop yourself from hurting another. It just becomes impossible. It's like no, it just no, that's just silly. <laughs> why would why would I hurt a pig to eat it? Or uh, it just becomes absurd. Does that make sense? because love is that universal connection with all living beings. And so you, you don't give up anything, it just falls away, you know? And so this is a win-win situation, you know? It's not only you saving the planet, saving other animals from suffering, you probably get some health benefits because, you know, most Westerners are probably a little bit overweight <laughs> and veganism is good, unless you're a really unhealthy vegan like me and I'm, Hitting the chips and all of the fries all the time, <laughs> you know. But most vegans are usually, you know, probably get a, a good health benefit from it. But also personally, you know, that makes sense. You become happier with a love and integrity. So always, if we do this right, the right understanding is always a win-win situation, including for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess if people want to learn more either about your own journey, it sort of sounds like it would be best for them to go and read your books. You've got three books out you were talking about. So do you want to give us a little bit of information on the differences of those? Um, yeah, I mean, the first one I won't talk about too much because it's, it's out of print. It's um, um, printed by the University of Western Australia Press. Um, I think people can still buy second-hand copies on Amazon, that sort of stuff. The second one, my cousins, my friends, is about my journey um, with the orangutans um, and about and, and touches on veganism and that sort of stuff. And um, finding our humanity is 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 the next one. It's it's, um, it's, it's about more probably the, the high level stuff we talked about and uh, the spiritual journey um, and the inner journey, which needs to accompany our outer journey um, um, to help others. And so, yeah, they're all autobiographical, but they all kind of take a, a different aspect. But they all are also designed not only to give information and, and hopefully tell a good story, but to help the reader. If, um, you know, there's something that would actually read, actually, I've got something out of it. I, I feel better about this. You know, I feel, you know that it's a win-win situation. Um, and that's one of the challenges of being a conservationist um, in this most important decade in human history is the default is to get depressed and despondent, mm. you know what I mean, and feel bad, you know, oh, my God, look at the, what's all happening in the news, you know, why wouldn't you feel depressed and despondent and just want to switch off? Um, but by not switching off, we can save the planet. But also my message is it can be a wonderful, joyful journey. Mm. Does it make sense? It, it's not a miserable journey. The, yeah. the, the, the selfless work and love for others is a, is a journey of joy and, and, and wonder. And, and so it, it's something that shouldn't be avoided, but actually embraced. Mm. 
Yeah, absolutely. And is there a plan for another book? I, I don't have a, um, a plan for a, another book. Um, at the moment, yeah, the, the, yeah, there isn't there, there isn't there isn't any space for that. Yeah. <laughs> at, at, at this time, so at the moment, it, it's 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 lecture tours, echo tours, and the um, yeah, and obviously the, the vast majority of my time is concentrating on, on the on the on the ground outcomes. Um, working with my field managers, um, and my, and all the joint companies and foundations which I'm associated with. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's been absolutely intriguing to learn so much more from you firsthand. So people can jump across. I know that the Rang Tang Project is quite active on Instagram. You've also got a website, Facebook, etc. So I'll link all of those in the notes um, and also as well Orangutan Odyssey so that if anyone who's listening is interested in joining you over there, it's definitely mm -hmm. on my bucket list. So hopefully it won't be too long till I can come and join you. Is there anything we might have missed before we finish up no nothing i can particularly um, think of but yeah thank you for having me on your podcast and i hope your listeners um got something out, out of this i'm sure they absolutely will that yeah there's so much you've got a wealth of knowledge we're very um lucky to have you not only helping animals but also as a vegan living a fantastic lifestyle a great example of what we can do to help both you know farm animals but also the mm. greatest species and people across the planet so thank you yeah, you're welcome thank you thank you